So again, please turn to John chapter 20. And as a reminder, um, I had jumped ahead to John uh, 20, or John 19 last week, and John 20 this week to hit the, the accounts of the resurrection and the, or the first, the crucifixion last week, and then the resurrection this week. And then next week we will be going back to pick up where I left off at the end of chapter 13. I think I completed 13. If no, I didn't actually even complete 13. So we'll be picking up next week. I would ask you all read ahead, study ahead. Um, I'll be picking up at verse 31 in chapter 13 next week. So we'll go back to chapter 13, pick up at 31, and then plow through, plow through the rest of the book, obviously skipping um, the portions that we've covered in these last two weeks. So chapter 20. If, if the narrative of John, in the, in the gospel here of John, if the narrative had ended with what we looked at last week, chapter 19, it would have been like the stories of all great people, all heroes. U human biographies, generally, we can usually agree, hopefully, that the earthly biography or, or the biographies of earthly people will eventually end in what? Their death, you know, and... If someone does a biography on someone who has passed, it ends with, with the fact that they had passed away. The story of Jesus would have been just another story of a, absolutely an exceptional man with exceptional righteousness, exceptional character, a man who did miraculous works of God, a man who was a great prophet of God. I think it was obvious. But the normal end to his story would have been that he die. All great people eventually die, and some of them at tragically young ages. But the major difference between the life and teachings of Jesus and those of any other religious leader of all time lies in the fact that Jesus what? He, he rose from the dead. No other, even no other religion has a hero that rose from the dead. Jesus is not just another dead hero. He is the God-man. God in a human body. He died on the cross for me, for you. But He rose from the dead. He's alive. Well, let's look at the first two verses here in chapter 20. Chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Early on the day, first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put Him. Well, the first day of the week was the day after the Sabbath, which would have made it what? Sunday. Sunday. Sabbath. Always was and always will be Saturday. The day after the Sabbath was Sunday. And very early that Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and actually we know a number of other women went with her from, from other gospel accounts. John only mentions Mary Magdalene because his purpose was to focus on her and the situations revolving, revolving around her. But other women are listed in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke as having gone to the tomb early in the morning with her. You should notice also in verse 2 that, that we read there, Mary says that, um, well, let's just, let's just read it. We don't know where they have put him. We, she says in plural, indicating that she was with other women at the tomb. So though this account sounds like it's just Mary went there by herself, from the other accounts, and boy, I've learned that as I've never learned before. I knew it before, but it just has been driven home this week as I've compared the accounts of the resurrection from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there's differences. And you really have to put the pieces together. And I about, about drove me batty at times. Trying to, trying to put those pieces together. But I'm, I am convinced that Mary definitely didn't go there alone. She went with these other women. And here she even referred to, we don't know where they've put His body. So it's indicating even in this account of John that she wasn't alone, even though John just describes Mary going.
I believe that when the women got to the tomb, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. They saw that it was, the tomb was open. I believe they, they looked in and saw that Jesus' body was gone. And I believe at that moment, Mary Magdalene took off and went running to go tell, at a minimum, Peter and John that Jesus' body wasn't in there anymore. And again, if you read this in what we read here in John chapter 1, when she got to Simon Peter, and by the way, it says the other disciple, the one Jesus lo loved, that's the way John always refers to himself. John, the author of this gospel, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So it was, he, she went to, to Peter and John and told them, did, did she tell them that angels appeared and said Jesus was arisen? No. Is that what it says here? No, she just says, they took His body... And we don't know where they put it. I think that clearly indicates that though she went with the other women, as soon as they realized that the tomb was open and Jesus' body wasn't in there, she took off running to go tell Peter and John while the other women were still there. Because if you look at the account in Luke, then it was shortly after that while these other women are still there and they're wondering what the heck's going on that the angels appeared to, the, to those women and told them, that he's not here, he's alive. And again, this is we're studying John this morning, but but we gotta compare these other accounts so that we can properly understand what's being described here in John. When she when Mary told them that they have taken the Lord, who was they? Who who did she think took the Lord took the Lord's body? Um, it, well, you know, she could have we really don't know for sure. She could have thought it was just some group of grave robbers who, who came to you know, take the body and get any, anything off the body. And the, even, the, even the spices that the body was buried with would have had value. And the, even the, the clothing, or the cloth that the dead body was wrapped in and so forth. Um, she, she, many, many commentators believe that she thought it was the Jewish religious leaders that had come and take, taken his body. We, we don't really know for sure, but her, her whole point was the tomb's open, Jesus' body is, isn't there, and we don't know where they took it to. Somebody took his body out, and we don't know where his body is. Understand there's no mention here that Mary said anything about him being alive. Anything about the resurrection. She's talking about somebody stole his dead body. Right? It's important to understand that to put the pieces together of what happened that morning. Again, the account in Luke talked about angels appearing and telling the, the women that were in there that He was alive. So that has to tell us that Mary was already gone. Surely if she heard the angel talking to her, she would have told Peter and John that. And if the angel told her he's alive, she, she would have told Peter and John that. But no, what she focused on, she told him he's gone. They've taken his body. And that fault, we'll even see that. She continued to think that even as she got back to the tomb. Let's read verses 3 through 9. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple, that's John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. That was John. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now, there's a lot of, again, points here that there's a lot of differences of opinion about. I'm going to do my best to give you my explanation in as quick as a way as I can. First, I'm going to tell you, I don't think, as soon as Mary said that stuff, I don't think John and Peter took off and left and ran to the tomb. Luke says Peter ran to the tomb after all the women who had seen the angels that we read about in Luke and the angels had told the women that he wasn't there because he had risen and so forth. Then in Luke it says, and after those women told Peter that, then he took off for the tomb. And I think, again, if Mary went to them first just to tell him that the body was gone, that means the women were still there and then the angels appeared to them and then later on they went and told the, the disciples and others there. 
So in the, I don't believe that John and Peter immediately left as soon as Mary Magdalene told them this. I believe it wasn't until after the other women got there and said what they had to say that they took off and went. I, I can't fit the pieces together of the four accounts any other way than that. And boy, I've spent a power hours this week working on that, thinking that through. So Peter couldn't run as fast as John. John got to the tomb first, but he didn't go in. He just, he just bent over and looked into the tomb. He saw the burial cloths that Jesus had been wrapped in. As he looked in, he could see that much. As soon as Peter got there, he went right in. Peter also saw the burial cloths, and he noticed that the head cloth, the, the, the piece of linen that was wrapped around uh, Jesus' head, was not lying with the other pieces of cloth, but that it was in a separate place. This, the head cloth. Now, very quickly, I'm going to tell you there's m much more than what I can share with you about this this morning. There's a debate even over the translation of the Greek words um, used here in, in these phrases. It refers to the head cloth as, be, as lying in its place, rolled up, folded up, wrapped together, etc. There's various ways to translate that Greek, and depending on how people translate the Greek, they think maybe it means something different, or the significance of it is something different. There's, there's a number of different interpretations uh, of this particular passage, and especially relative to that head cloth, and then to top it all off, certain divisions of, of Christians have you know, some magical kind of views about the the shroud, you know, the shroud of Turin, and the, they think they had the actual cloth that was around Jesus' head, and there's all kind of stuff that, that, that comes into this. Some people think that the, that the cloths were actually positioned exactly the way they would have been wrapped around Jesus' body, so that it, it looked like, you know, His body would have had to have just passed right through the cloths, and they remained laying exactly the way they were still in the same shape that they were even around his head and his body and so forth. There's all kinds of stuff like that. And I'm here to tell you in hours and hours of studying all four of these accounts of, of the resurrection, I don't see how we can connect those dots so definitively. Some people seem to believe some of that stuff so strongly. Uh, could it be? It could be, but the, the details that I study in Scripture don't give me enough details to say, oh, that's absolutely, that's what happened. There's even, uh, you know, there's even, there's even a bogus story that floats around and people buy into it and it, it's been on Facebook and then everybody shares it because it sounds like a really great, really great story about how, you know, the, the Jews had this tradition that, that if somebody get up from the table, they would take the napkin, you know, and if, if, they, were, if, they, were, uh, if they were done, they would, um, they would just leave it there uh, crumpled up or something or other, but if they were going to come back, they would fold their napkin up. And so the fact that the napkin was folded up, and, and again, I think King James maybe translates it napkin, I, I'm not sure or something, but anyway, so this, this bogus thing is that Jesus was communicating that He was coming back because He folded this napkin up in accordance with Jewish... First of all, I did some study some time ago, and there is no such Jewish tradition that I could find relative to that. So I think that's bogus. And... Anyway, I, I'm not going to go any further, but I, that's, that's been around a lot. There, there's all kinds of things tied into this. Here's the bottom line for me. I always, if, if there are not enough details, I try to go to what's the simplest understanding I can take with what information the Holy Spirit led these four authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to provide to us. My bottom line is that if the body had been stolen from the tomb for whatever reason, if thieves were going to come in and steal the body, you, would they have unwrapped, took all the wrappings off, the burial wrappings. Would they have taken all that stuff off before they carried the body away? I'm, I'm going to say, generally thieves are going to be in a haste to leave, right, first of all. And if they're stealing the body, part of the reason they'd be stealing the body would be for what they can get off of it. And thirdly, the, this would even show, demonstrate that the theory that the Jewish religious leaders put out there was that the disciples somehow stole the body. But again, if they came to steal the body, they wouldn't have left the, the burial clause in there. If any of the other ones stole it, you know, other than Peter and John, they, they certainly wouldn't have, you know, went in there and unwrapped his body and, and then carried the body out. I mean, they took him and tried to get out of there quickly and how they could have done so with the soldier and the 
soldiers posted on guard and the, and the tomb with a seal on it, you know, it doesn't make sense anyway. I just think that the fact that the, you know, the fact that the, the burial cloth, what, in whatever form it was in, whatever you, however you translate the Greek, every, everywhere from just lying there to, to actually being neatly folded up, um, and lying there, whatever it was, it was it was separate from the rest of the linens, and so it it does does not give any appearance of a, any kind of a hastily arranged taking of the body out of the tomb. In any case, Luke's account says Peter was left wondering what had happened. I think that shows that again Peter's wondering how and why Jesus' body would have been taken. Why, why did someone take his body? Why, why were the burial cloths lying there the way they were, however that was? I don't think he believed that Jesus had risen from the dead at this point. I guess he possibly might have been wondering if it, if, if it could be true. Especially if this is after, as I believe, after the women who were in the tomb as described in Luke when the angels appeared to them and had gone back and said, Hey, the angel said he's alive. Well, maybe he was wondering about that. Could, could have been. But the way Luke describes Peter walking away and leaving the tomb, he's like wondering, what is going on here? What, what has happened? He's certainly not rejoicing in understanding that Jesus had raised from the dead. When John decided to go into the tomb after Peter had been in there for a bit, verse 8 says that he saw and what? He saw and believed. But then verse 9 says, in which, of course, again, remember, John himself wrote. So he's kind of writing about himself here, too. But he says, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And he had to be referring to himself and Peter, the two who were there. And so he's describing himself going in there. And he saw and it says he believed. But then the very next verse he says, but they, meaning him and Peter, still, still did not um, understand yet that the Old Testament said that, that, this, that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Most theologians, I will tell you, think that this means that John at this point actually did believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but he just didn't understand yet that the Old Testament had said that that would happen. Nor probably that he understand why it would happen or, or like what would happen next or what would come next. But yet Peter probably didn't have any of the pieces of the puzzle put together yet as he walked away. I would say the best references of Old Testament Scriptures that would speak of the resurrection of the Messiah are Psalm 16, verses 10 and 11, Isaiah 53, verses 11 and 12, and Zechariah uh, chapter 12, verse 10. The failure of the disciples to understand these Old Testament predictions about the Messiah rising from the dead, listen, I think plainly tells us that the disciples didn't make up a, make up a resurrection story to fit the Old Testament account. Think about it now. If they, didn't, if they still even weren't putting together that the Old Testament had said that the Messiah would die and, and rise from the dead, they wouldn't have fabricated a story of a resurrection to fulfill that Old Testament prophecy if they didn't really understand that part of Old Testament prophecy to start with. They wouldn't have made up a story to make that prophecy come true if they didn't even understand that prophecy, which it, John indicates here that they didn't yet. They didn't tie in the Old Testament predictions that the Messiah would rise from the dead. They still didn't get that. And so that throws out the, the window, the theory that the disciples would have just made up the resurrection to say that it fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. They didn't even understand the Old Testament prophecy. It, John says it right here, if you can track with all that. Later on, when Jesus spoke with them for 40 days after He rose from the dead, and then after that, after He sent the Holy Spirit to teach them, then they came to understand these truths. They came to understand how Jesus' Messiah had fulfilled all of those different Old Testament prophecies, including the ones about the Messiah suffering and dying and then rising from the dead. Later on, Jesus and the Holy Spirit both taught them some of that. Let's read verses 10 through 12. 
Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. So Peter and John, they, at this point, they each went back to wherever they were staying in Jerusalem. But Mary Magdalene, who had returned to the tomb after she ran and told Peter and John that the body wasn't there anymore, Mary Magdalene, she's back to the tomb now at this point. Maybe she even arrived while Peter and John were there, but she didn't leave. She's still staying there crying. And at some point, she looks into the tomb, and what she see? She sees two angels. And again, this is not the same account as... The, the rest of the ladies seeing the two angels because it doesn't match up with what John describes here. And I, I don't have time to go into that any, anymore, but we need to keep remembering that point. So she looks in and she sees these angels. Um, when angels appear on the earth in the Bible, they usually appear in the form of men. Um, now Luke described the angels that the other women saw as having been, quote, uh, having clothes that gleamed like lightning. But John just describes the angels as simply wearing what? White, just wearing white. And Mary didn't respond to the angels the way, if you read the account in Luke, the other women responded when they saw these angels, they fell face down in front of them, you know, with their faces on the ground and so forth, and they were scared. Mary didn't react that way at all when she looked in and saw these angels. Well, let's go to verses 13 through 15. They, the angels, asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. So we're not told, did, did Mary... Did Mary realize that these were angels that were in the tomb talking to her? We're not told so. Nor are we told why she, she didn't react differently if she did. If she realized they were angels, she had no reaction to it, right? Certainly, especially contrasted to the reaction to the other ladies that saw the angels as described back in, in uh, the Gospel of Luke. And if she didn't know that they were angels, well then, who did she think they were? And why didn't she ask, like, what are you doing in Jesus' tomb? You know, she, there, we have nothing. We have no information about any of that. And so all we can assume is it doesn't matter to the point that John was trying to make here. Because we don't, simply don't have the answers to those, to those questions. I would say, it's, is it obvious to, to you now at this point that Mary still was not thinking about what? Resurrection. Resurrection. Like she's still looking for what? His dead body, right? And she turns around then, and I'm going to talk about it here, and sees Jesus, and He says why she's crying. It never says she even answered the angels. But she turns around, sees Jesus, and He says, why, why are you crying? And she says, they've taken my Lord's body. You know, if you've taken it somewhere, just tell me where it is, and I'll, and I'll, I'll go get it. She's definitely not thinking resurrection at all. And this is setting, the, again, the picture in the Gospels that, that Jesus' disciples were not looking for Him to rise from the dead. They did not get it when He told them He would rise from the dead. They were not expecting the resurrection. When He died, they're, all they're wondering is, why would someone take His body and how did that happen? We don't know why Mary turned back out toward the outside of the tomb. After the angel asked that question, you know, why are you crying? But when she did, she saw this person standing there that she thought was the keeper of the garden. And once again, like it or not, we have a lot of unknowns. Mary didn't recognize Jesus at first. Why? I mean, we don't know. Why didn't she recognize Him? Why didn't she recognize His voice the first time when He spoke to her and asked her why she was crying? She obviously still didn't recognize His voice. I read all kinds of commentators writing guesses about why, you know, tears in her eyes, foggy, misty, morning, whatever. You know, again, waste of time in my mind. No, no disrespect intended, believe me. But I, I think it's a waste of time trying to guess that stuff because there's no way to prove any of it. For some reason, she did not recognize Him by sight, 
when she looked at him and she did not recognize his voice at first when he, when he asked her why she was crying. Mary Magdalene had been very devoted to Jesus. She had been absolutely crushed by His horrific death. And remember, she stood there and watched it at the cross. Now she continued to grieve and she's further slammed because what? His body's gone. She thinks somebody took his body somewhere and she can't, you know, he doesn't even have the, you know, doesn't even have the respect to have his body lying in peace in his tomb. Somebody has drug his body off. Now she's, you know, that's just another thing she's slammed with. She just wanted to get his body back so she, it could be properly buried again and, and her Lord wouldn't have to suffer any further disgrace than he already had. Verses 16 through 18. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. And this time, what was the news? I have seen the Lord. And she told them that He had said these things to her. So when Jesus spoke to Mary again, He simply said what? Her name. Her name. And she immediately knew who He was. What, what was the difference? Again, we can only guess what the difference was when, when He asked her, why are you crying? That she didn't recognize Him. But when He said, Mary... She recognized who He was. I think we should be reminded of what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. The shepherd knows his sheep by name, and they know his voice. In this moment of the height of human emotion, Mary went to Jesus and held on to Him in some way. Most people picture it that she fell at His feet and you know, hung on to His ankles. Very well may have been, but I can certainly see it that she just ran up and, and grabbed a hold of Him in, you know, in a hug. How, however it was, she was experiencing really an indescribable wonder and joy. And as I, as I tried to think through this, and I, I pictured this like, what, you know, experientially, what this would be like. You know, what I thought of, you know, my dad died suddenly of a heart attack when he was only 41 and I was only 20. And, 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 and I also thought of, of my, my mom's mom, my grandma Guyer, when she passed. I was really close to her. Like, in, in a couple of days after they had died, if, if I'd have seen them coming up to me and talking to me, you know, I thought about what would have went through my mind, what, how, my emotions. I, that's what I would say to you. This passage has, has always choked me up. Um, to just picture, you know, closing my eyes and picture Mary when, when Jesus said, said her name. How, how she, when she realized that and what she, the emotions she experienced at that point. And that, that, my example that I just gave you, that was the, probably the closest thing that I could think of myself of how it would probably still be that way even now even though my you know my, my dad has been gone you know for a long long time and my, my grandma not you know pretty long too but he actually died before my grandma but um, but back then like fresh like a couple days after he had after they had died to have seen them like to have, to, to have them walk up to me and talk to me I actually had some dreams that dad did that and um, you know, woke up crying and stuff. And um, that you know, this isn't about me, but and I didn't want to get choked up. But I'm just saying that I I picture Mary again. She is in the depth of grief, and she obviously loved Jesus and was so devoted to Him. And when she realized that was Him talking to her, what it must have been like. We read these passages. What I'm trying to tell you, I'm taking some time to tell you, is please don't just read words. Please put yourself in the situations. Try to understand what the people were experiencing and doing and going through. Good and bad, you know, anger, sadness, all of it. it these were real people, real things that happened. Well, when Jesus said, do not hold on to me, 
he wasn't like refusing, oh, don't, you're not allowed to touch me. I, it had nothing to do with that. He was making it clear that he was going to be around for a little while yet. Again, he was going to appear off and on to them for over a 40-day period. So she didn't have to fear that he was just going to you know, vanish and not be seen again. Yet. So yet. He had not ascended back to his father from where he had come. Yet. But he said eventually he was going to do that. He was going to return to the heavenly realm where he left to take on that human body and be born, you know, first put into Mary's womb and then after nine months being born but, and then living through his 33 years or so on this earth. But now he was going to go back to where he had come from before he had took on a human body. And he told her to go tell the rest of his followers that he was going to do that. Mary obediently went to the disciples and told them that he, he had, she had seen the Lord and He had talked to her. We're not told what their reaction was. I think, I believe again, try to follow this, that this is clear that this, when she went and told them this, this is not the same telling that in Luke that you read about when the women went and told the eleven and the other who, who were with them that Jesus' body was gone and the angels had told them, told these ladies that He was alive. This is not that same thing. Again, they hadn't seen Jesus yet at that point. It has to be clear. If they would have, they would have told the eleven that, I'm sure, just like Mary did here. And this is also not the same as when Mary ran to tell John and Peter that the body was gone earlier in verse 2 when we first started this today. This is a third different telling of something relative to the events on Resurrection Day. And I think you have to order all them when you sit down and try to figure out how, the, how all these pieces of the puzzle fit together. Let's read verses 19 and 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, what's that mean, that first day of the week? Okay, but that, what was that first day? The Sunday that what? The Sunday that Jesus rose from the dead. So it's saying on that evening, on the evening of that first day that Jesus rose from the dead, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after He said this, He showed them His hands and His side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So again, this happened on the evening of the day Jesus rose from the dead. Many Bible commentators say that this just involved the eleven, the closest. There was a twelve. Judas was dead, so they left eleven. But there would only have been ten of them because who wasn't there? Judas. No. Always already took Judas out of the picture. So there's only eleven instead of twelve. But then there weren't eleven. There would have only been ten because who wasn't there? Thomas, Thomas wasn't there that we, that we find out here shortly. Many people think so that it was just those ten that were there. But other commentators believe that there were other disciples of Jesus who were there as well. You don't want to know what I think? Whether you want to know or not, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> what I think is, if you compare Luke 24, verses 33 through 49, I think the group had to include more than just those ten. It had to include other disciples. Probably even, you know, some of the women. The passage in Luke doesn't seem like it would allow for any other conclusion. And I don't have time here today to go and read it to you. I'll trust that you'll be curious enough to want to do that for yourself. But I, to me, I read that and I read that passage over and over. I don't see how it could be anything other than it was more than just the ten of the, the closest followers there. It had to be some of the other ones with them too, according to the passage in Luke. You really have to compare all of the accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of this stuff. But I'll tell you, it does get confusing. And again, I spent many, many hours uh, working through this. In any case, those who were behind locked doors because they were afraid that the Jewish leaders would come after them, okay, I, I think that's the case. I think they were afraid to, of somebody coming after them to, and that they would end up with the same fate that maybe Jesus did. But again, if you read the account in Luke chapter 24, it says they were very excitedly talking about something. Does anybody remember from Luke what they were excitedly talking about before Jesus appeared? Anybody remember? The road to Emmaus? Ring any bells? Two, two guys on the road to Emmaus, Jesus appeared to them, right? 
and and the first he kept them from understanding who he was, and then after a while he revealed who he was to them, and then they were like, "Geez, how did we not know?" And then he disappeared, and they get up and immediately did what? Went back to Jerusalem to find the others and say, "What? We've seen Jesus." And they walked in. They walked in to, to the group at some point. If you read the account in Luke chapter 24, they walked in. And when they walked in, the other guys were talking, or the other, at least the other people there were talking about what? That, that Jesus had appeared to... No, Peter. <laughs> that Jesus had appeared to Peter, it says in Luke 24. Now, the... the Jesus had appeared to the other women too, but that's not a part of that account in Luke 24. These are all the pieces you have to put together. But when the guys from Emmaus got there to the, to the room that night, they walked in and it says in Luke that they were excitedly talking about Jesus has appeared to Simon. And these guys said again, well, guess what? He's appeared to us too. And so, you know, oftentimes when you see that scene enacted, when Jesus appeared in the middle of them, the scene is like, oh, everybody's, you know, and everybody's down and, you know, oh, yeah. But you read the account in Luke and it said they were excitedly talking about how Jesus had appeared to, to Peter. It says Simon, actually, which he's Simon Peter. And, and then these guys said, well, yeah, it says we, we saw him too. And then, right after that, is when it says in Luke that Jesus appeared. John doesn't share those other details, but that's part of the problem when you only look at one account. John wasn't focusing on those guys from Emmaus or anything like that. That wasn't a part of his purpose, but to put together what happened that night, you've got to put it all together. And so, these guys from Emmaus had got there, added their testimony of seeing Jesus to the fact that Jesus had appeared to Simon Peter, and then... They're in the midst of talking about that, and all of a sudden, what? Jesus. There's Jesus out of thin air. One moment He wasn't there, the next moment He's there. Locked doors didn't matter. He showed them His hands and His side, and Luke says He showed them His feet, too. So the disciples who were there saw some kind of an evidence of, of wounds from the cross. And I'll just quickly tell you, again, there's debate, and I don't think there's any way we can really know for sure, but, you know, like, were the holes still the whole way through His hand? Is that what they saw? Or was it scars? You see it, you see it um, written about both ways. Uh, you know, was, was it actually still the fully penetrated wound, like, could look, see light through it? which it's been depicted oftentimes that way, or was it actually like a healed over scar? I don't know. I don't think there's enough information to know for sure. If somebody can share me, enlighten me some more, I'd, I'd love to hear it. But I, I haven't been able to find anything that would tell us one way or the other. But they saw at least evidence of the wounds in his hands and in his side, and Luke says even in his feet. Jesus also ate a piece of fish. Luke tells us when he got in there to, to try to demonstrate that he was real. Like, in a, this is a real body here. As with Mary, the account with Mary I talked about earlier, can you even imagine the joy, the excitement, the, the, the like, un disbelief? Like, I, I now have to believe it. He's there, but I can't believe it. I mean, can you even imagine? The danger of hearing these stories so often is that we get callous to them, I think. Slow down, think through this stuff, pray through it, think about it, live it with them, try to imagine yourself in a situation It really lights the Word of God up, I'm telling you. And I can only do so much in... Obviously it lights me up, but I can only do so much in sharing how it lights me up. You've you, you got to do it for yourself. Luke also tells us that there was a degree of fear in some of them. You know, thinking that... that He's just a ghost. What else could just appear and disappear? But that's what Jesus was trying to assure them, that even though his, He had these special properties, He had supernatural properties in this body, it was also a real body that they could touch, feel, hug. He, he, he ate something in front of them. It was both. It's the resurrection body. It's the kind of body that you and I will have one day, if, as long as you all have true saving faith in Jesus too. Amen? Amen. Verses 21 through 23. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 
And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And I'm going to have to keep moving here. This is, this is kind of big stuff here. Hang, hang with me. Try to track. Jesus gave his disciples a new commissioning. Now that he had risen from the dead, now that he was soon going to be ascending back to the Father in heaven, he said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. you. And guess what? That you is including you and me. The Father had sent the Son into the world as the, as the Father's designated representative to fulfill the Father's purposes. Jesus had done that. He completed the task. Now Jesus was going to send His disciples into the world as His designated representatives to fulfill His purposes. And as the Father had sent the Son to speak the Father's words, to do the Father's works, and to lay down His life for the salvation of souls, so Jesus was sending His disciples to deliver the gospel message, to make more disciples of Jesus, to teach the new disciples to obey the Word of God, and to teach these new disciples to give their lives in service to Him, both in sacrificial living and up to and including, if necessary, physical death, just like He died. And I will remind you again, it was not only those original disciples to whom Jesus gave these marching orders. Jesus gave those marching orders to all who would become His disciples, and that includes you and me, if we have true saving faith. Those marching orders are only for those who have true saving faith in Jesus. This thing about G Jesus giving the Holy Spirit in, that night to those in the room, uh, that may have just been a symbolic gesture um, of what He would do 50 days later on the day of Pentecost, when all who would, had saving faith in Him would, was, would receive the Holy Spirit to permanently dwell within them. You can read Acts chapter 2. And since Pentecost, everyone who has come to true saving faith in Jesus has received the Holy Spirit to permanently dwell within them and lead and guide and convict them and comfort them and so forth. If Jesus did actually give the Holy Spirit to those in the room that night, it would have just been some kind of a temporary indwelling. Like um, people of faith had, had had for all the years before before the cross, God would send the Holy Spirit upon people for periods of time for, for certain purposes, and then the Holy Spirit would leave him. The Holy Spirit did not permanently stay indwelled. And so some, some believe that that night that, this, that, that uh, the, the Holy Spirit was given in, in that kind of a way, just a temporary kind of a way to those in the room to, to give them guidance and understanding and comfort until the time uh, 50 days later, again on the day of Pentecost, when they would permanently receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the last thing Jesus' pronouncement about forgiving sins has been badly, badly misunderstood. Badly, badly misused by certain groups of people for a long, long time. We need to understand one thing right away. No doubts, no questions. There is no human being who has the, the authority of God to forgive anybody's sins. Nor withhold forgiveness of anybody's sins. Let me tell you, I know that this can sound that way. Let me tell you what I think it really says. Surely I think any reasonable study of the Bible will tell us that only God can forgive sins. God does not forgive sins because we decide we're going to do it. Or God doesn't like withhold forgiveness of sins because we're not willing to give it. God doesn't depend on us. We depend on God. So what did Jesus mean? I think true believers can state the reality of the truth of the Word of God. We can tell somebody who accepts the Gospel message claims saving faith in Jesus, calls out for forgiveness to Jesus, we can tell them with absolute authority of the Word of God that if you have truly done that, you have truly come to Jesus in saving faith and sought forgiveness of sins, know that He died for you on the cross, your sins are forgiven. Not because I forgive them, but because what you have done, if you have truly done that, what the Word of God says is, your sins are forgiven. Conversely, and don't miss this point, because today, when we do this, we're going to be called that we're judging people. But if somebody says, well, I don't believe that this Jesus stuff, you know, I don't, I don't believe that. But I don't think, you know, I think I live a good life and I'll, I'll get to heaven and so forth. By the authority of the Word of God, I can say to that person, I'm sorry, but your sins are not forgiven. And you will not go to heaven unless you come to Jesus Christ in saving faith. Not because I am withholding forgiveness. I'm simply stating the truth of the Word of God that because they reject Jesus Christ, their sins are not forgiven. I think that's what Jesus was saying here. 
And we can still go out and it's the same thing for us today. We can state those truths by the authority of the Word of God. Not that we are granting the forgiveness. We are declaring what the Word of God says to people one way or the other depending on what they do with Jesus. I'll just say too, we need to be careful in the in-betweens. Like, yep, by, we're supposed to know people are truly saved by Jesus by how they live. But be careful. If somebody isn't living the way they should live, uh, I, don't, don't be pronouncing judgment on them that they're not saved because that's not what this is talking about. We'll say, according to the Word, you should be doing such and such and you shouldn't be doing this such and such, so be careful where you're at spiritually. But we're not to say, your sins aren't forgiven. You're not saved. If they claim to be saved, I've got to say, okay. You need to understand what the Bible says. You shouldn't be doing those things then, or, or you should be doing these things and you're not, so I hope you are. Just understand that difference too. 20, 24 through 25, heading down the home stretch. I'm going as fast as I can here. Just a few more verses here. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came that first night. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. And that, that verb, the Greek verbs, actually, they continued to tell tell Thomas, repeatedly told him that they'd seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you, same as, same as before. And then verse 27 says, And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. We'll tell you real quickly. Uh, obviously, Thomas's nickname, Doubting Thomas, of course, comes from this passage. Um, I, I will tell you that when it says, at least here in the NIV translation, it says a week later, literally in the Greek it reads after eight days. And I will tell you that when the Jews referred to a certain period of time, like from a Sunday to Sunday, would have been eight days. They counted the day of it in the, in the, in the last day of the time period that they would cite. So it was literally after eight days, but it was also actually one week later. It was the next Sunday night. Won't get into that anymore. You probably don't care about it anyway. Um, it, but it is another good example of the kinds of issues that impact translation from the original languages and the original cultures and our understanding and interpretation and so forth. This is a pretty easy one to see. We would never know that unless you understood the Greek translation plus the Jewish cultural way of referring to a, a certain time period. That these are the kinds of things that impact properly understanding Scripture. Um, so this happened the following Sunday, uh, Sunday night, one week after the resurrection day. Um, Jesus told Thomas to look at his wounds, touch his wounds, and finally to stop what? Doubting, Doubting and... Believe. Jesus was with him. Jesus was alive. And now Thomas believed. And not only did he believe that Jesus was alive, Thomas made one of the greatest statements in the New Testament. He's called Jesus my what? Lord and my, God. my Lord and my God. Um, the, those are both were Greek words used of deity. Uh, Lord is translated from Kyrios. Kyrios was often a Greek word used to translate the the holy word for God of the Hebrews, Yahweh. And um, God comes, of course, from Theos. It's the most commonly used Greek word in the New Testament for the one true God of the Bible. And Thomas acknowledged Jesus as Kyrios and Theos. Finally, verse 29. Then Jesus told him, told Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet, what? Believe. Have believed. Jesus followed Thomas' great statement of adoration of, of Jesus as being God with a great statement of His own. Thomas had physically seen Jesus. And so he believed in Him. Certainly, Thomas was blessed to see the risen Christ. But many, many more blessings would come to the many, 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 many more people who would not see the risen Christ with their own eyes, but yet they would still what? Believe. believe. I'm one of those blessed people. Are you? None of you have seen the risen Christ. 
Are you one of the blessed who have not seen, but yet have believed? Jesus Christ is the risen Lord, victorious over sin, sorrow, Satan, doubt, and death. The great preacher G. Campbell Morgan called the resurrection of Jesus faith's anchor. He said, quote, The living, risen Christ is the center of the church, the creator of her character, and the inspiration of her conduct. His resurrection is the clearest note in the church's battle song. It is the sweetest, strongest music amid all sorrows. It speaks of personal salvation. It promise, promises the life that has no ending. The resurrection declares to all bereaved souls that them also that are fallen asleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. And therefore the light of His resurrection falls in radiant beauty upon the graves where rest the dust of the holy dead. This lowly preacher, me, I say to you that the certainty of the resurrection is the strength of the true Christian's faith. It is a strong wind in the sails of those who believe. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is our hope and our victory. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's from 1 Corinthians 15. If you have believed in Jesus in true saving faith, rejoice with me today in the victory that Jesus won for us in His death and in His resurrection. Amen. And if you have not believed in Jesus in true saving faith, I simply say in closing, why not? Why not stop doubting and believe? Christ the Lord is risen today. And that's the closing hymn, 367. Would you turn there as we close?